Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yay. All right. I always get a little nervous until I see all the yeses and I'm like, Phew. all right, technology is going to work today. All right, everyone. Well, hello and welcome to part two of our Meaningful Change series. This series is sponsored by our lead sponsor, Praxis Precision Medicines and Neurocrine Biosciences. My name is Casey Craig. You may know me as the SNAA mom to Stella, but I recently took on the role of the official Cute Syndrome Foundation moderator and social emotional program director. I am so excited to be here with you today to continue the Cute Syndrome Foundation Meaningful Change series. Last week, we had the pleasure of chatting with our friends at Praxis regarding their SCNAA program, Prax 562, and they started the conversation about the program with Citizen and how it will help them enable their clinical trial for our community. If you missed last week, no worries. The link to this recorded video can be found on the SCNAA Family Support Group Facebook page. Now, moving on to today's event how your medical records can help support an SCNAA clinical trial and beyond. Today, we have the folks from Citizen, and they're going to discuss their SCNAA program. They are ready to answer our questions about their platform, such as how to sign up or how to make the most of your Citizen experience and how Citizen is working to support research within our SCNAA community. Before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items. So group interaction through questions and or comments will take place in the chat box only. The chat box to your right allows you to type questions and or responses for Hillary or any of our guests at Citizen. To your left, there is a title or a tab titled Expo. In this area, you will find troubleshooting if you're experiencing technical issues, or you may also type a request for help in the chat box. Our technical guru, Megan Varner, is back today and will help you tackle any technical issues you might have. Just a friendly reminder to mark your calendars for next week, part three of our Meaningful Change series, how we learn to make medical decisions in a crisis. You will hear from the experts, some of our very own SCNA families, on their experiences when their children were in crisis. This subject, of course, is not the most enjoyable topic but it's time to normalize these conversations and what better way to have an open and honest chat with our fellow SCNAA families. You will not want to miss next week. Now I would like to introduce our very own Hilary Savoy. She is the founder and director of the Cute Syndrome Foundation and she is quite frankly a force to be reckoned with and is moving mountains for our SCNAA community. Without further ado, Ms. Hilary Savoy. Oh, yes, and happy birthday, <laughs> D. Super exciting. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. So um, thank you, Casey, and um, welcome, everyone, to what is really sort of marks the official start of the full sponsored sessions of our Meaningful Change series. Um, and again, just uh, to cover some background, this series is focused on the ways in which the knowledge found within our SCNA community can be leveraged to better support all of our children. We are a super active community, um, <laughs> as evidenced by our work last week with the Citizen First Citizen campaign. Um, we have a history of engaging deeply, meaningfully, and measurably among ourselves, as well as with the medical research and drug development communities. And we want to dig deeper into sharing the benefits of those experiences. This session today is going to be focused on the SCNA Day campaign with the Citizen Platform. I know all of you have been hearing a ton about Citizen from us. And as you know, we filled our first 50 slots with Citizen in a matter of basically a half day of work, um, which really, I have to say, is quite the message about how things get done in the SCNA Day community, which is that we move fast with the right partners to the right positive ends. Um, and as a result, as many of you know, uh, we opened 100 more slots for our community. 
We also understand that those of you who are joining us today may be at different stages in with respect to the citizen sign up process. So I just want to direct you guys to um, in the like just above the chat function on the right side of your screen. It says chat, polls, people, Q&A. And if you can click on polls, there should be a poll there to tell you if you have signed up with Citizen already or not, or if you have questions, um, just so that we can really gear our time today to your needs. Um, and with that, as you guys go ahead and start answering the poll questions, um, I would like to welcome our guests from Citizen to join me on the screen. Um, you guys just press that share audio and video button. I'll give you guys a second to join, but it's Virginie McNamar, who is the patient engagement director. Oh, there she is. <laughs> um, and she's also the mom of Tyler, a five-year-old boy with Syngap. And Gio Beek, who's the lead clinical reviewer of, neuro of the neurology um, uh, department at, at Citizen and a genetic counselor. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, so it's lovely to see you again, Virginia, and so nice to meet you, Gio. Um, we're gonna give the families just a little bit of time to fill out that poll before mm -hmm. we get started. Um, and usually our families sort of roll in and out a bit, as you might imagine, throughout the session. Um, we like to keep things pretty casual and conversational here, so... Um, <clears throat> We want to just do our best to answer questions as they come through on the chat and, and try to guide the discussion for our families um, in the most meaningful way. But maybe we can start a little bit with each of you giving a brief introduction, you know, about who you are, what brought you to Citizen, and um, and what excites you about, about your work. Yeah. Virginia, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so like you said earlier in my, in my introduction, um, I have a five-year-old boy with Syngap, so I'm... Um, very familiar with what you guys are all um, experiencing as a special need mom as well. And I was part of the rollout of Citizen at, at SRF and was super excited to see what Citizen could do for families and then started getting feedback from families as they were getting their records in. Um, so then there's an opportunity to uh, that opened up at Citizen and I jumped on it. <laughs> and match my skill set, thankfully. Uh, and now that I'm part of the, uh, on the other side, I guess, I'm even more excited because I do see everything that is possible with that data that we collect. And um, and then the exciting conversations with ha we have with researchers and pharma companies uh, that, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, I'm at the right spot, I'm excited. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to have uh, to see how your community responds to seeing their records on the dashboard and then uh, have more interest from researchers in pharma. So that's me, I guess. <laughs> for Jenny. And Gio, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to Citizen? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a genetic counselor by training. Um, I worked at Mayo in Rochester for a number of years. And I kind of that was kind of like right around the time when exome sequencing was really taking off. And, and so I was kind of part of that like rare disease buildup at Mayo. And then I, I moved on to Children's of Minnesota, where I ran the neurogenetics program. Um, and, you know, just focused really, really honed my skills in on rare neurologic diseases. So um, I started doing contract work with, for Citizen about almost a year ago, not quite a year ago, and was just like looking for an excuse to jump on full time. It's a, it's like a super impressive team and it's just been a wonderful organization to be a part of. And I think really it came down for me that like when you see patients in clinic, you're helping one patient at a time, which is certainly, you know, it's certainly a, a rewarding task, but looking at citizen, like we're doing things that are helping you know, dozens or hundreds of families all at the same time. So it kind of feels like your work is like amplified in this really cool, uh, cool way to be able to kind of make a bigger mark on, on, on the rare disease community as a whole. That's amazing. And I think that's, that's um, such an interesting challenge in the rare disease community, as you say, to, to leverage um, what's being learned in smaller groups to, to serve larger populations. 
Um, it looks like we've got a few answers for the polls. The majority of people that are here look like they're already fully enrolled. So maybe what we can, which is great and unsurprising because um, Virginia and I were just talking about our numbers actually right before we popped on here. And it looks like we now have 80-ish um, families <laughs> enrolled. Um, so uh, first of all, can we just pause and talk about the fact that that's incredible? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, I think you've, you've blown uh, all records of enrollment in the neurospace. Uh, when you, on, on April 1st, I kept updating everyone on the chat, our team on the chat, and uh, Gio at some point responded with a jet, like, was like, what? <laughs> Are you serious? Uh, we have the wait list. Like, uh, I, I was expecting the wait list to be turned on much later than it did. And I, we were just like, uh, it was exciting to see it. So like Singap, we held the previous record. Uh, it was like 48 hours to enroll 50. And you guys did it in less than eight hours. So you, you set the bar pretty high <laughs> for uh, upcoming communities. But it, it's exciting. It really showed that you've You've done a good job, Hillary, communicating to your families, um, to the families, like what what that means and and how it's going to help uh, overall. And and I think that's it's not always easy to understand. Um, families are always asked to participate in, you know, fill this and fill that and get on the phone with this this clinician or this scientist, and it's just constantly we're constantly being pulled in different directions. And I think um, being able to activate your community like this, that means like you really did a good job explaining what citizen does and how that's going to be helpful. You know, yeah. plug for citizen, it only takes 10 minutes to register. So that would, <laughs> we help you a little bit on that. It's not yeah. a two hour survey that with heartbreaking questions. Um, so. Yes. And I think that's one of the, the things that we really worked um, to explain to our families. And in some ways, you know, the, the, I, I like to say when we were being asked questions about how quickly we were able to enroll for this, that yes, there was a ton of work that happened in the days leading up to the enrollment, but really the bulk of the work has been happening for five years, right? right? Is, which is educating the community on how, and our, and our families on how important their, their participation and their data is yeah. um, so that when we're asked, you know, it, we've been able to do this multiple times now with different partners to execute something really quickly um, because we are such an engaged community and that that's so important. Um, and it's important for our families to hear that from people other than me, because I'm always telling them how important they are. So thank you for, <laughs> for no, helping it me is, prove that it, it does send a, a really good signal that, you know, when you have a pharma company that's looking at two different genes or they have to make a choice who to go who to go with first they'll go with the one that can fill you know that can fill out the surveys that can like really getting get engaged and then um the one that has the most data or at, yeah. not, it's not necessarily quantity it's also quality but in your case with citizen we provide both quantity and quality you know, you, you, your cohort is pretty impressive so yeah and I think the other thing you mentioned how quick it is to enroll. And I, I know the majority of people on here who can enroll are already enrolled. So that's great. But I think it's, it's really important that they, um, that we highlight for anyone who hasn't enrolled yet, that citizen really does the, the bulk of the work for us, yeah. which is, I think as a, in the rare disease space, we're always being asked to do so much work yep. <laughs> and we so rarely see results or so rarely see benefits for ourselves. And so to have a company that came into the space and said, okay, not only are we going to collect this data for you, we're going to provide you a benefit and, um, we're going to make it super easy. And for the families who don't know, citizen hired a team of bill collectors to collect your medical records, which I think is just so brilliant. And it makes me, makes me laugh on many levels. Um, because They're amazing. It's nice to have someone like that working for us. <laughs> yeah, we had an internal funny conversation yesterday and I was like, what made you go in collection to begin with? Who, like, how do you choose that line of work? <laughs> Uh, and their answer was really funny, but they were all really glad that they transferred those skills to Citizen with, you know, kind of to uh, echo what Gio is saying is like now they really feel like they're making a difference. And that team is 
absolutely wonderful. They know the kid's name. Like they, they really take it. It's not just numbers and they, because they have to, you know, they, they go out and they talk to the doctors, they talk to the institutions and they, they, they hound them to get those records and they kind of develop that interesting, not really, you know, like they have that, oh yeah, that, and they pull up the names and like, I remember the records from da, da, da. And so it's, it's amazing that the, the, it's not just a job, right? They really understand that they're making a difference. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what I love. It's, it's just across the team. It's like, we all have the same mission. Um, so. That's wonderful. Um, so to dive in a little bit and, and folks feel free to hop in with questions as you have them. I think for the first bit, let's focus on, you know, I mean, ask your questions as they come up anyone, but, um, in the chat, but, um, for a little bit, let's focus on for people who are enrolled, they have their, theoretically their dashboard is all set up. Um, we did get a parent who reached out to me yesterday and said, how do I get back to my dashboard? I put, I put all my information in. Um, and now I don't know how to get back. So maybe we can start there. Uh, yeah, how do you so get back to your dashboard? When you go back, it's app.citizen.com. And then you just log in. So if you want to yeah, put that in the yeah. chat. So app.citizen.com, you log in, and then you should see your dashboard uh, right there. No, right now your dashboard might be a little empty because we've just started record co- record, ugh, record collection. Uh, but you will get emails and notifications when records are coming in. And those are super exciting. Uh, I remember dropping pretty much everything that I was doing. First email from Citizen, like, hey, we got records for you. <laughs> I just like jumped on it. And then I went into that deep rabbit hole where I was just like reading every single page of what was there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's thousands of pages. Uh, and Gio knows because he's going through <laughs> he's like, yeah, there's a lot of those. <laughs> um, but yeah, so right now your dashboard is going to be a little um, a little empty, but it's it's going to start filling out. And at first, don't worry, you know, it's going to look maybe a little unorganized because everything is just getting in there. Uh, and once our team has gone the uh, through the data analysis and uh, organization and everything, then we'll, we'll, you'll have a, a timeline uh, populated, but it's not going to be for several weeks. Uh, and so the data is is fully ready. But in the meantime, you'll be able to access all of those, read all of them, and then share with either everything or just share specific records with whoever you want. Uh, okay. It's amazing for second opinion or, you know, if you're transferring a provider, that's always really helpful. Yeah. Or they don't believe you when you when you answer a question <laughs> and you're like, yes. The proof, <laughs> this medical record right here, <laughs> stand. Yes, and I know Praxis was talking to to us. Um, can't remember if it was on a private conversation or whether they mentioned it when they came on or not. But they were saying that they got an email from a parent in the two A community that had wound up um, hospitalized and in an un, at an unfamiliar hospital and had sent a thank you letter to them because they were able to pull up what they needed in this new hospital. And I think um, that's not something you wanna have to plan on. A second opinion is a great use and maybe we can try to keep it to that instead of emergency hospital visits in unfamiliar places. But if it happens, it um, it's all there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and we've, we've, we keep hearing those those testimonies from, I mean, I'm obviously a lot more in tune with the Singap community because I'm in there and, and, and it's um, how many parents were in, in an emergency situation or a desperate situation and they were stuck because changing provider, they, they couldn't get the records or it's going to take weeks and their yeah. child doesn't, like when seizures are completely out of control, you don't have weeks to waste uh, until everybody, everybody get their act together. And so she was she was so excited. She's like, you have no idea how many hours. And like, you just saved me so much time and angry calls. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, yes. you know, it's interesting for me because <clears throat> my role at Citizen, <clears throat> excuse me, is I'm mostly living in the medical records. I'm living in our review tools and like actually going through the data. So like, I really see firsthand the power of what that looks like on the back end. But I sometimes like completely forget about 
clinical situations where families come in with like binders full of medical records. And it's like, as a clinician, like, how do you, how do you look at a thousand pages? Like, there's no way to search it easily. There's no way to figure out like what's important and, what, and what's less important. So like that, even just the like aggregation of all of your medical records is it, it feels like a side effect of citizen to me. It's not yeah. like the, the main like end goal, but it, yeah, yeah. We always hear these, these stories of just like how much it saves people um, yeah. time and efforts and all those things. I see we've got a couple questions coming in in the chat, which tie in pretty well to this discussion. So I think Gio to, to that end, do the records get continuously updated <clears throat> as a child is hospitalized um, and lab visits done? So you have the, we only update records when the, the caregiver puts in another request. Okay. Or if there is a researcher or pharma company who needs the data okay. uh, and they need the most up-to-date data, in that case, we'll go in and, and, and do another uh, fresh collection. Okay. Okay. So, so basically it's um, until you have like the date that the, that the program opens back to whatever oh, records exist. Yep. And then that's, uh, that's the cohort. And then as a community, could we come to you and ask to be updated? Um, or does it take a researcher or can, and, and then it sounds like as individuals, we can also request updates. Yeah. So it, as a community, if there's no research attached, it's going <clears> to <throat> depend on our capacity, who okay. else we have in the pipeline. Um, but if there's a researcher and there's like something very specific in the pipe, then we'll do a, a, a fresh upload. Um, okay. But that, and that's, we'll communicate dates like that. We'll just be transparent on when. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to get the updated data. And then an individual. So like for my dashboard, for my child, I can ask for an update. Yeah. So we can just keep, okay. So um, Dianali is asking and happy birthday, Dianali. Um, how often should we request? <clears throat> um, she says Max is doing a number of things each month. So for um, personal use. I don't know, Gio, what are your thoughts on this? You're the one with the data. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think it kind of depends on what those things are. You know, like there are certain that. there are certain pieces of medical records that are just um, <clears throat> like more valuable from a data perspective and from like a research perspective. Um, and like Virginia said, it also kind of depends on like just the capacity that we have at Citizen. Like our team is growing literally every day of more people who are, who are working on medical records, but you know we have contracts with other groups, and are, there are kind of a lot of balls up in the air at all the time. So um, you may like when upwards, when you update um, requests, that information may be you know um, records may be you know fetched from the different organizations, but for them to actually be updated and included on like the neural card or, or more of the information that's provided, that may take longer. So it's kind of a nuance of what what you want to request those records for. If you just want to have them centralized, that will certainly be a much quicker process. If you want them included into the whole data of what we have about, about your individual child, that might take a little longer. It just depends. Okay. So it sounds like rule of thumb is we know <clears throat> now to, to this date, we've got that background. We, we, you know, as parents, we kind of have a good sense of what all of that is. And then anything you know, that's happening over the next, say, six months or so, maybe you kind of keep, make sure that you, you keep track of yourself, even if you're asking for those updates so that you know that you have it on hand. And I would say if you go to a new institution, I would definitely go back and at least add that institution okay, uh, so that you don't forget because it's easy to forget. And I think mm -hmm. there's a good question about local hospital yes. and an ER visit. Uh, from what I understand, I don't know about ER visits, but from what I understand when, um, you get a lot of good information, Gio, on uh, hospital discharge. Yeah, we do. So yeah, we I think, include. Yeah, I mean, all those things are, of course, looked at when we're seeing the medical records. I think that, you know, ER visits are good for some things and not good for other things. For like the major clinical pieces that we're pulling, it seems like ER visits don't don't lead to often new diagnoses. It's usually like an exacerbation of a previous issue that's coming up rather than something brand new popping up. So 
from that perspective, a lot of those things are, a lot of the information is redundant. We already know about those things. Um, but kind of the general rule of thumb we use is we, we're worried about starts, stops, and changes. So we want to know, for instance, a medication or, or a clinical diagnosis. We want to know the earliest date that something was started. We want to know if it was, if a diagnosis was removed or if a medication was discontinued. And then we also want to know about any changes like, you know, are, are seizures getting worse? Are, are you increasing dosages of medications? Those types of things. So kind of start stops and changes are the one, are the things that we really um, are focusing on kind of in the data that we're pulling. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, and do you guys have a mobile app at this point for all of that information? It's not it it's an app, it's, a, it's mobile friendly. <clears throat> it's, okay. It, yeah. Okay, um, fantastic. So I think I wanna make sure that we also talk to, you know, presumably there are some people here um, no one polled is saying that they're on the waiting list, but we didn't get we didn't get everybody polled. So I want to make sure that we talk about people who are on the waiting list and also people who <clears throat> may sort of be in that gray area of having started an account, realized, hey, shoot, I don't have this item or this other item. I'm going to come back. Um, can we just walk through, you know, if you're on the waiting list, what should you so if you're on the waiting list, uh, you will, the waiting, the waiting list is just you giving us our name, your name to let us know that you're interested in being part of the study. So uh, you should have gotten an email yesterday asking you to go back in the platform and register. Uh, and then there's, uh, do you want to put in the link to? Yes. Yep. I can. The landing there we go. So there you go. So you just, uh, you follow that link, it will take you to the landing page. And then you just um, start the onboarding process and then just go all the way through, follow all the steps. So that's if you're on the waiting list. Um, if you started, if you created an account and did not complete your registration, um, just go back to app.citizen.com and uh, it will take you right back where you left. And then you just follow the steps all the way to the end. And I know we had a few people who reached out to us who had run into problems, especially I think the birth certificate. I know, like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's one of those like painful things as a parent where yeah. some of us are very organized and we know exactly where it is. And some of us are really organized and have put it in a safe place that might not be the easiest to access. Um, and some of us may think we know where it is and then have trouble finding it. And um, I would and say, I, like, I would, if you do not have your birth certificate, uh, or you cannot find it and you need to order it, just let us know. Like we, we will follow up because we'll find it that it's not in your record and we need it to collect records uh, on your behalf. Uh, so just let Mikkel, you get an email from Mikkel, let Mikkel know that uh, you either don't have it, lost it, need to order a new one, or it's coming. You have it, you, you need to just go get it. It does take a while. That's what we're saying. It takes like we have families, it takes over a month sometime to to order and, and receive your birth certificate. So I would definitely get the process started. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I had a panic moment when when we first uh, were introduced to Citizen and like, you need birth certificate and this. I know I have all the documentations, but I was like, do I have all the that? Oh, do I have it? Do I <laughs> <laughs> like as a dual citizen? So I was like, do I have American birth certificates, <laughs> going through frantically all, all the all the paper records. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, and the reason we need and I don't know if that's been communicated to to the community. We need your driver's license, the birth certificate, and that's and then your signature. It's so that we can. It's pretty much giving us the authorization and the right proof that we are collecting those those uh, records on your behalf. Yeah. And um, so we have our HIPAA, you know, our form with all the law written saying that we, um, the hospital should give us the records. <laughs> and um, I, I do want to plug how great your tech support is for anybody who has sort of started the process and ran into a hiccup or hasn't started yet. Um, tech, I, I know of a number of parents who just contacted tech support during the process and said, Hey, I don't have this. Can you, can I still, 
you know, take yeah. these next steps and they've been really helpful. So I think don't let something not being in hand limit you guys for and signing up. Through, definitely go all the way through. And, um, and especially you guys are, are part of a, um, a core for, from Praxis. And so they're asking some questions that are very important, like the seizure questions. Um, and so those are things that you, you can answer right away. And, um, and that, that's going to give some good information to them um, even before they get all the data. So definitely go as far as you can on the process. And if and you if get you... stuck, reach out to the help support or to me, and then we'll, we'll help you uh, go all the way through. And if, um, if people signed up for the wait list, I mean, so I want to make clear for everyone, we've got this cohort is open through Sunday or until all of the spots disappear. Um, and so if you are on the wait list, but haven't started onboarding, that spot won't be there after Sunday. So Correct. you want to, you want to make sure that you, you, you get there. Um, yep. and it seems like we have another question here. Let's see, um, from Sandy, uh, do you have the ability to find records from an institution if you participated in a study, but your child was never actually seen there? A genetic study my, my son was in. Is that yes. Yeah. The short answer is yes. We just need to know, um, you know, who the contact person would be. It's typically who the researcher would be. But we do have a lot of families where we are we're pulling kind of initial genetic test results from a research study. Um, the one caveat to that is sometimes there's not good documentation from research studies. So if there is anything to be requested, we can request it. But if they don't have like something in writing or, you know, actual documentation, there's not much for us to, you know, to receive. So that's maybe the only caveat there. So would they, how would they go into the dashboard to add a study <clears throat> like that? Oh, as Boston Children's. <clears throat> yeah. So I think, I don't know, you know, I'm not familiar with all the dashboard things, but I think that being able to just give us as much information as possible, if you know, location, if you know the, the physician who is in charge of it, those are all super important pieces of information because I mean, we're literally having somebody that's going to call them and is going to say like, hey, we are looking for research studies. Like, what do you have for us? And so any any additional piece of information is good to go or is helpful. Um, also, timing is it can be really helpful too. If you know when it was done approximately, that gives us okay. one more piece of information to, to kind of grab a hold of. And when um, sort of a general note, when people sign up, they're only asked for two in institutions, right? They're asked for the institution that ordered the genetic testing, and then you're given the, the chance to add an institution. Um, but then once you're in your dashboard, right, you can add as many institutions as, yep. um, and I assume um, the the thing you want us to do, although Gio, I know it will make lots more work for you, um, <laughs> is to add wherever we've been seen, right? Yes. The more you can add, the better, because then we can get the the full picture. And honestly, we'd rather have the sooner we get that information, the better, too, because if, if I go through records and and I see that there's a big gap in, in years or I see that you're not I don't have any of your neurology notes like those are kind of glaring things that will will come back to you and say, like, hey, were you seen by somebody else where we may be missing records? So we're able to kind of follow up. But that all, of course, then slows things down, too. So as much as we can get, as early as we can get it. Okay. So um, it sounds like we all have, um, since the majority of us are signed up, we have our marching orders to go into our dashboard as soon as possible and make sure we make lots and lots of work for GEO. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, really, like, focus on the specialists. Uh, I think mm -hmm. what, what GEO and, and Ali have been saying is the the specialists are definitely the priority. Pediatrician, it didn't sound like mm -hmm. you were getting a lot of really good info on them. Yeah, it's just, it, it's, a, yeah, it's, I mean, there are some things that are just less kind of critical to the, the data endpoints, you know, things that just all kids have um, that are mostly things dealt with by the pediatrician. I mean, that's not specific to a rare, a rare disease. It's just part of being kids. So those are things that are just not as helpful. Um, so yeah, specialists, specialists are certainly the, the richest sources of, of data for us. You know, just in thinking about how much time it takes to get through a pediatrician's note, there's usually not as much. But when I get a neurologist's note, it's like, 
I'm going to be there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's uh, what I've seen. Cause now that I've seen the notes come on, on my son's record, I'm now preparing myself so much better to meet the neurologist. Cause a lot of things that they write is what I tell them. And so <laughs> of course they, you know, they, verify that it's that I'm not completely crazy and it is accurate. <laughs> um, but it, it does now I'm a lot more mindful of my time with a neurologist and what I what the inf the information I want them to write down so then then it's back on the records right that's really important because I, I think you're exactly right Virginia we as parents we're often the sources of uh, you know especially several years in our doc, we are all landing with good doctors, hopefully that realize that we're their best source of information. And so I think thinking about it in those terms is, is really helpful, especially when you realize it's not just for clinical care, it's then for better understanding the community as a just whole. Just like when you get a new seizure type, for example, like it's not going to be caught at the doctor's office during an EEG, right? You're going to see it at home first. So like writing it down, like the day and what you saw. And that's all I think helpful instead of just, oh, I was about a month ago. Cause we all see our neurologist every what, six months or something. And so, yeah, yeah, it was kind of in that time frame. <laughs> and it is, I think it's, it's very important that we realize that, um, I think seeing the inside of the drug development and research process in the rare disease community, um, parents need to understand that like the ways that this stuff has been done for years and years and years for cohorts of you know, people who are you know, 200,000 people getting treated with a drug, um, drug development doesn't happen like that. Research doesn't happen like that when you have a population of 500. Um, <clears throat> Eventually, all of the information, it's coming from us, whether it's through like 10 intermediaries or directly. Um, yeah. That's so we sort of have this responsibility, um, not that we need more responsibility, but responsibility to our, our child and the community to, to make sure that data is collected appropriately and accurately. Um, <clears throat> so... I guess um, I know we have a couple of international folks on um, on with us today, and I want to I want to be mindful of the fact that we um, and tell you guys that we have this amazing international community who are all so so eager to be helpful and involved and engaged. Um, and all too often we have to limit things either to just the U.S. or to English language speaking countries. Um, and I I want to give you guys a little bit of a chance to talk about because we're getting a lot of questions about when, if, when, how our international community can get involved in Citizen and, and what that looks like. So Citizen is opening international uh, onboarding for English, um, medical records in English only um, in like the first week of May. So that's when we're opening up that, that special onboarding. And it's a little different because um, for international folks, you will have to go in and collect your medical records. So we'll help you. We have, we're putting together some guides in each country to kind of just say, here are kind of the guidelines. But our team is not able, we don't have juris jurisdiction or whatever <laughs> to explain it uh, in each country. And so that's, that's we're going to rely on, on the families to go out and get their records, which can't be... Um, a fairly daunting task. So we're trying to get it um, as trying to make it easy as, as easy as possible. Um, but yeah, it's beginning of May, but by then you're unfortunately your cohort will be done uh, and on, on Sunday. So it's just going to depend if there's going to be another SCNA cohort. And, in, and at that point we'll work with you on um communicating with your international families, what they'll need, how to get their records, and, and the, the, the process that they'll, um, that they'll have to go through. And, and the feedback that we're getting, because Syngap is going to be, uh, we're going to be launching in May for international families. And uh, I was concerned because I'm always about giving them the least amount of work to families. And I was really concerned to say, you're going to have to go and get the records yourself. And, and the feedbacks were pretty good. Uh, a lot of them understand how important it is to have them anyway. Mm 
uh, and and to get that control. And at least now they know they will be in a safe safe place. It's not just like a big binder or uh, somewhere on their computer that just doesn't. So I, so I guess that's um, that's been the appeal as well. Uh, and knowing that they can participate in the in the study has been important yeah. too. So that's important, I think, for the families to understand that it it will be more work for them. Um, it will. And, and but it's it is it's so important and <clears throat> it still has this tremendous benefit. We don't, I guess, won't have the the bill collectors working working for us and the Sherpa service. But you will be um, will be the the you'll be the bill collector, and so we'll uh, they can give you some uh, <laughs> some pointers on how to. <laughs> oh, you know what? Why don't we do that when we when we um, if we open an international cohort? Maybe we should get we should get your Sherpa team on to uh, to talk to our families. Maybe we should have them on anyway, just to talk right. to our families about how to how to access what they what they need from. And and I would say it's it's uh, it's something that I learned the hard way, not with my Singap son, with my daughter, who's typical, but um, she's twelve. And um, she had an MRI done when she was a baby. The hospital, and I wanted to go back to that MRI um, because they say what hit. Anyway, I needed it around puberty time, thinking plenty of time, it's fine. The hospital doesn't have it anymore. They only they can only keep it ten years. They couldn't keep it longer, but they're required ten years. Mm -hmm. And you know how many times they change their systems it's gone. So I don't, it's just can't have it anymore. So I think that's an important message. Uh, and that was a big eye opener for me is because 10 years from now, Ty's medical records are going to be as important uh, as they, you know, the, we need it to, yeah. when we do a natural history study of a disease, you need the whole picture. Uh, and so being able to, to keep those records uh, and make sure they don't disappear, that's, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, Dianali is saying some doctors' offices only keep seven years of of medical records. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I guess maybe that's a plug to do this for all of your children if you have extra kids. <laughs> maybe uh, <laughs> you're thinking about some of some of these not for citizen, not with citizen, but um, you know, for, to be thinking it, about. Yes. Yeah, it is having it on hand, especially if there's things that you want to go back to like in my daughter's case i mean it was nothing i'm sure she'll be fine <laughs> but it's uh yeah you, you don't want to lose that that data and shelly's asking a great question here um if there are other cohorts that are research studies that our cohort maybe if someone in in our group has say a cardiac issue that you guys are working on with another group will those be flagged um, so that we can share our data if there's any overlapping diagnoses. So when you, and, and Gio, you can probably get on, on this at some point too, um, you can enroll, um, you can look at the, the studies that we have right now and then you can enroll with um, whichever fit. Uh, but when you join, when you're on board, you consent to, you have an option to consent to the uh, Citizen Research Data Bank. And what that allows to do is that if someone comes in and say, I want to look, and I'm just going to take epilepsy because it's a, that's an easy one. I want to look at pediatric epilepsy and, you know, some things. We can look across diseases, not just the A day community. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where it's important. That's where citizen is also kind of like another mm -hmm. uh, big powerful tool is that it's not limited to your disease. Like your data can help other conditions as well. Yeah. Uh, if if you are eligible for that study, I guess. Right. And certainly true, like within within like the neuro we'll say the neurology branch of Citizen. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, Citizen really has two big, big pieces. It's the oncology piece and it's the neurology piece. And the disease models and the the ontologies are like the dictionaries that support those two two areas. Are different because obviously you're interested in capturing different medical information for neurology cases versus oncology cases. So I think that if you did meet um, if you if you if you did meet criteria for multiple different arms, what you know within oncology and um, 
and neurology, you'd be able to sign up for those. And it would probably be like a separate data pool for each one, because it's just, it's kind of, it's slightly different in the way that it's, um, the, the way that it's abstracted. And we've had um, in, in the Syngap community, there uh, a couple who, uh, uh, mothers who had breast cancer and like they're on board, they heard about citizen for the through Syngap onboarded their daughter or son, and then just realized that uh, they could also benefit from, from it as a breast cancer survivor, or um, I, I don't know the top of my head, all the cancer that we support, but um, <clears throat> that one. Um, yeah. 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 I think it's and, breast cancer, cholangiocarcinomas, uh, and then like liquid cancers, liquid cancer. you know, lymphomas. Um, yeah. And I think that also gives a good opportunity to, uh, again, looking at people who haven't signed up yet. And again, if you're in watching today and you haven't signed up or you're talking to your, your friends who are trying to decide, like we have a lot of people in our community who might feel like from a phenotypic perspective, um, maybe they're, they're not a clear SCNA case or they might be a mild case or there might be some genetic background that's complicated. Like in my case with Esme, who has four mutations and you know, who knows um, what's causing what really. Um, and I think families sometimes are afraid, who fit those criteria are afraid to share their data to skew the data set. Mm -hmm. But I think what's so important here is to notice what we're wanting is as broad a data set as possible so that we can um, capture the community as, wide, as widely as possible, but also if you're looking across the neurologies or across epilepsies, um, having that broad spectrum is also really important. Absolutely. Um, so Dianale is asking, will we be notified if and when a researcher is using our child's records? Are these records only for Praxis and Neurocrine? Um, so we usually notify our partner if we get a request from a researcher or a pharma company uh, to use the cohort data. Um, if your, your specific, uh, child, if it, I don't, uh, I don't know if we'll, if we communicate directly with families, I'll have to go back to the team on that. Okay. Um, you will know if there is, so in, in some, um, in some studies when there's extra surveys or more work for families, like obviously you'll know because we'll, we'll contact you directly and say, hey, you are eligible for that study. Do you want to be part of it? They will use um, the, the citizen data plus uh, X, Y, and Z that they need to, 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 to get. Um, so in, in those cases, you'll, you'll know. Um, but otherwise, we communicate with the advocacy groups and say we got requests and these researchers are accessing the data and right. uh, we'll pass on um, as, you know, as long as we were allowed to to the community. So that because, again, I think it's really important that we show our work, right, that we know as a community that we're, we're giving data. I mean, so often we give data to things and, you never and we never see results. Yeah. Um, just get siloed somewhere and not shared and not published on or published, you know, in yep. very minor ways. So um, our foundation will certainly um, make sure that we communicate back anything that we know and can communicate uh, about what's happening. And really us. what I, what I love about, what I loved about citizen and, and one of the reason I, um, I joined is that it is really patient focused uh, that's the whole mission is to empower patients to, to, to access better healthcare. Um, and so everything we do is with that in mind. It's not, it, the priority is not on pharma is not on, you know, the priority is the patient and giving as many opportunities as we can to the patients to access treatment or better healthcare. Um, so that's, that's, um, and I think, I hope you guys will see it in, a, in down the road as we keep working together, that it's reflected on, on our relationship with the SCNA community and, and other communities. Um, 
but we we try i mean there's um another uh, rare disease right now there's a pharma company accessing the data and they ask more for um more information uh, for surveys um and then citizen re asked if they could do a pass through to patients so that in terms of like a, a fan financial compensation for for their time so mm -hmm. i think it's it's we're trying to find mechanism is like your data is so valuable but you should still be in charge and and see the impact of it i mean that's the bottom line it's like not you're not just taking the back seat signing it away and then mm -hmm. just hoping for the best <laughs> yeah and i think that actually that there's part of the the question that dianali asked that i i want to flag um because praxis is who partnered with us on opening these cohorts yeah. um obviously they have a goal in mind you know yeah. for our community and um and it's you know they've been absolutely fantastic partners and i have to um pat them on the back for wanting to gather this kind of data and for recognizing that this is the way to do it to come directly to us and have a share in this way um and but what happens if another pharma company in the space wants access to the data? How does that work? So right now, uh, um, there's a short time of exclusivity for Praxis. Um, and then after that, um, when pharma or researchers or anyone wants access to data, they come to us to fill out a researcher agreement. Uh, uh, they submit their research protocol. We review it and then we green light it and then give them the data. So I wanna, I also wanna- Also kind of um, researchers, if they're attached to university, do not pay for the data. Right. And uh, pharma company, it's a licensing fee. So yeah. we are not, I'm just, I wanna just, and that's something that I was very adamant as a parent, mm -hmm. citizen is not selling the data. And, and the licensing fee is because those pharma company needs it. They need it. And they would have um, spent a lot of time and money in getting something close to what we can provide. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah. But and I think I want to. The researchers, they don't. And I think it's important to flag for the families this approach about not having having the exclusivity be temporary. Yeah. Um, and again, there's you know there's background stuff like that that families don't necessarily get to see or need to really fully understand. Which is, you know, there's a lot of when you are dealing with companies, you know, there's there's questions about ex exclusivity and and when things get shared. And um, as an advocate, my job is always 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 we share as much as we possibly can. And I'm constantly hounding and, you know, hounding, beating over the head um, <laughs> to make sure that that is what is a priority. Um, yep. Because in this community, we just can't afford for people to be exclusive for long periods of time and not share the data. It's not in the community's best interest. Um, and thankfully, this is something that is changing and it's changing through, um, efforts of advocates and efforts of, of companies like Citizen that are insisting that that our interests remain at the at the center of yeah. um, these discussions, um, which they, you know, haven't always historically been and, and going forward, they will more and more. And it's actually quite exciting. Um, I want to be sure we have time for another question. Um, Karen says, my, my daughter is 23. I'm one of those parents with all the binders. Um, I have no doubt. Um, she uploaded some of the records when she signed up, but should she do more and what types of records should she focus on since you're not going to be able to retrieve records um, going back? We, necessarily might. To so we might be able to. Um, I'll just, there's a um, older patient in the SYNGAP community, and I think they were able to retrieve um, records, I think, from 1975. Oh wow! So if 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 those institutions have kept it, then we can get them. So I would definitely try. I would definitely like list those older institutions mm -hmm. and providers, um, and uh, and then if there's gaps, then we can we can work with you um, 
with the Sherpa team on how to get those records uploaded and just prioritize uh, so that you don't span hours scanning and uploading. <laughs> we'll, we'll help you work through it. <laughs> yeah, because on the clinical side, when we're looking at those records, I mean, we don't know what we don't know. You know, like if the records are there, we have no idea what else exists unless they're specifically referenced. Um, so a lot of times when we see important things that are referenced, we will make notes of those and ask our Sherpa team to recontact families and say, you know, we're looking for a note or a, a procedure or whatever it would be from X date so that we have that documentation. But I think that also as parents, you know, you'll be able to, when everything is kind of completed and you see all of the data, I mean, you, you know your kid better than any of us ever will just from reading medical records. So you'll probably be able to look at that and say, boy, there's a lot of, of, of additional details that were missed and, yeah. and just providing us that information, it's easy to get it updated. So you'll know, I think you'll know better than we ever would what's missing and what's what needs to be added. I also wanna be sure before we um, end today that we talk a little bit about um, data sharing across platforms, because I know, I think our families are, you know, they're constantly being bombarded <laughs> with requests to share their data. And I wanted to um, be sure that we gave a little bit of a snapshot about really the different types of data that exist and how they interplay. Um, so that, you know, families, as you're having these kinds of questions about you know, I, I signed up for citizen and now the acute syndrome is asking me to fill out this survey. And, you know, this is just, it's all a lot. Um, so I just wanted to be sure that we covered the ground of, you know, there are, are cross-sectional surveys, right? Where we come to like the survey that we partnered with Xenon on, where we came to the community and said, hey, we need a snapshot of all of you guys at this moment in time. And we had a 77% response rate on that survey, which is pretty amazing. Um, and we did a great job with that that is sort of a different thing than what we're doing with citizen citizen is allowing us to do essentially a longitudinal study which historically longitudinal studies involve doing something like a natural history study where you're having to go to the doctor to have tests done that you've already had done <laughs> you're repeating them um, and then they're tracking that or also um you can do a retrospective longitudinal study or a, a, a longitudinal study where you're inputting patient reported data. And often that's a huge lift as well because you're having to sit there and, and input everything. So this is sort of the same kind of a study, but it's done, all that background work has already been done, right? Your kid has already had the test. They're already in records and Citizen is pulling <clears throat> all of that. And it's important to understand that these different types of data provide different things at different times for different people. And a lot of the background work we're doing with Virginie is making sure that those data sets talk. So we're putting unique identifiers on all of the citizens data. They have been put on all of the um, Nord registry data that the acute syndrome is gathering. They're put in the SCNA day registry so that without identifying any of you, those records can all be tied together. And we can learn from hey, here's this study being done over here. The acute syndrome's doing a, a study on feeding tubes and formulation um, that we're working on with Praxis. And then that can be tied to the medical records at <clears throat> Citizen. Um, so I just wanna be sure that we plug that for the families that they understand. That they're <laughs> repeating yeah, that, work, yes, but it- That's very important uh, because like we, we talked about at the beginning is like you, you spend so much time and if nothing talks to each other and then what's the point? I mean, at the end of the day, what we want is researchers, whoever's looking at the data that they have as much as they can quality, but still that they have the full picture. Um, so yes, like you're exactly right. We, we match, we kind of combine the, we take this unique identifier as much as this one across the different platforms. <clears throat> Um, so that when uh, researchers access the data, they do not have identified in information. So they don't have your child's name. They don't have like a lot of the things that you don't, your address, your email address, like they don't have any of that, but they have all of the, what matters. And then they can match it with the other studies. And I think oh. further too, for like the data that we're actually pulling, you know, all of those individual diagnoses or individual medications 
we we have built our ontology or like our dictionary of terms based on standardized terminology that is you know widely accepted across the US and the world. So anybody could take that data and take those codes that are associated with those data points and compare it to any other data set that exists. So it's it's really like an apples to apples type of comparison. You know, it's 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 not just we pick the word that we think is best describes the seizure. I mean, we use all standardized nomenclatures and terminology. So it, it really is like kind of um, we say the harmonization of that data is really it's a high harmonization rate because it's easy to share. It's easy to to compare to other things. And that's that that's also so important for our families to understand is that the data is really only as good as it is organized and shareable and usable. Um, and and that's again something you guys are are giving us, which is amazing. Um, and accessible because we that's, that's one of the comment that we get from a lot of communities. You know, they have a registry or they have something, and it's a nightmare for anyone to access it. Um, and that in this day and age, you shouldn't be able to. It, it yeah, there's yeah. making in place to access good data. Yes. Yes. And, and to do so in a way that makes it as universal as possible and not, um, yeah. not locked up. And I think that's, you know, a, um, a good, a good note to end on. Also, I know I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, you know, I'm so, so grateful for you guys um, having joined us today to answer these questions and um, want to do one last plug. Anyone who hasn't signed up and can, you know, obviously do, um, the link is in the chat. The link is in the support group. The links are everywhere. I know our team has been working endlessly um, reaching out to you. And I'm sure you, you know, our families are all super tired of seeing. <laughs> you want to be <laughs> like citizen, you but to, to tell Hillary to back off, just sign up and then you'll be done. Yeah. <laughs> sign up and, it's, <laughs> and I'll go away for a little while. Go while. away. Um, she knows. Yes. I'm sure if you can. So again. Uh, with the foundation she'll know you're in <laughs> yes and lots of um you know if you have questions if you have problems let us know let our team know we'll make sure that we get um them answered or get you connected up with someone who can help answer them um next week we're going to meet again for another meaningful change series event we're going to be talking um with parents about making decisions in a medical crisis parents on experiences and what they learned and what they want the rest of us to know. Um, and again, I want to thank our um, guests for coming and sharing so openly and meaningfully and just engaging in dialogue with us. Um, and I want to thank our event sponsors, our lead sponsor, uh, Praxis Precision Medicine, as well as Neurocrine Biosciences. Uh, big thank you to Casey for hosting, as always, um, to Megan for tech support. And most importantly, to our community for showing up with your ideas and your insights and your requests and your questions. Um, this is how we get the work done for our community. How uh, we show what we can do, we show up, we do the work, and hopefully soon we rest. <laughs> so let's get all signed up so that we can all rest. <laughs> so thank you guys again for joining us and um, we will see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you, Gio. Say hi to everyone at Citizen for us. Really? Thanks. <laughs> okay, bye.